This is Startup Catalyst with Equanimity Investments. My name is Monica, and I take care of uh, investor relations at Equanimity Investments. And with me, I have Rajesh Seger, who is the managing partner with Equanimity. Um, Rajesh is a veteran investor, has had over 25 years of experience in the listed space in private equity, as well as uh, as an angel investor and finally as a venture capitalist. So I thought, you know, who better to walk us through the investor side of the story and the other ecosystem that venture capital supports. So we talk a lot about venture capital from how it supports startups and their growth. But we don't talk about how venture capital has created a new asset class. And that is what we wanted to cover today. You know, asset uh, venture capital is a pool of funds where investors put in their money. And that money to put together is invested in startups and then creates a new uh, opportunity uh, for investors. So this is what we wanted to cover today. Uh, welcome, Rajesh, and thanks for joining us. So my first question Thanks, Monica. For you thanks. Is, uh, thanks for having me. So the first question I had was that you have been a part of the early mutual fund story and, uh, you know, the early startup story as an angel investor in 2007 when you started. And finally, now a venture capitalist in the early stage of the venture capital story. So I wanted to know your experiences in all three and what have the commonalities been? What would the differences be that you see between the three stories that you have start, worked on starting and your experiences? We have a few hours for this or I <laughs> have to keep it short? <laughs> uh, See, I'll tell you. Yeah, yeah, I think it's been a fabulous journey. Uh, as you as you shared, uh, I started with listed markets uh, in the early '90s. Again, those were very very early days for stock markets. I was also fortunate enough to uh, uh, to join the private equity bandwagon uh, in the year uh, 2000. Again, from an India point of view, pretty much early days for private equity uh, industry as such. Uh, you know, angel investing, I started, I made my first investment somewhere in 2006, 2007. So again, uh, you know, pretty early days for angel investing and, and, and you know, investing in startups. Uh, I think if I recall right, in those days, uh, you know, there were no investment bankers who would, you know, peddle deals in, uh, in the early stage ecosystem because there weren't as many. We didn't have as many investors. We didn't have as many deals. We didn't have, therefore, no bankers. Uh, and I think in 2017, when we started Equanimity, uh, at that time also, this whole, you know, mushrooming of VC firms and early stage firms, uh, you know, it was, was still to happen. So I think in that sense, it's true that uh, uh, somehow I managed to, uh, you know, participate in these growing ecosystems. Uh, and I think the, uh, the simple, uh, uh, you know, gain from there in, in my experience has been uh, that you really see the industry growing in front of your eyes, which means you understand all the nuances. You are able to see, uh, you know, it's an undue advantage, but you're able to see uh, trends which are about to unfold. Uh, you know, like, for example, when the whole 21 uh, bull run happened in our markets, the unlisted markets, uh, it was just, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think a good strategy, but also some good fortune that we were able to from our first fund, sell some companies and return capital back to our investors. Uh, we've not been able to sell anything in 22, 23. It's not just us. Nobody's been able to do that. Uh, so, so I think in that sense, being a participant in any of these ecosystems, which mushroom later on has been a, 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 a true blessing in disguise. And I would, uh, you know, go, go a little one step further. And, uh, you know, for anybody who's listening in and for whom this, uh, this may be relevant, I think we all need to figure out the new things or the new trends which are which are long lasting. And I think therein lies the challenge. Uh, you know, new things happen every day, but are they long lasting? Can you make a career on that? I think those are questions you need to mull upon. And uh, and if you catch that trend right, uh, I think uh, there's no uh, there's no way you will fail. You know, you will be successful. Lovely. Uh, so as a product, what is the key difference that you see between a listed asset and an unlisted asset? Are there any different considerations that one must look at when, you know, thinking of the unlisted space? Because we know pretty much what to look at for listed now. Yeah, lots of difference. Lots of, uh, uh, you know, relevant and material differences. Uh, I think at the core, whether it's listed or unlisted, it's a business. And I think from that point of view, when you're trying to understand the business as an analyst, as a fund manager, 
there is no difference it's a business right uh, but i think from a from a participation as an investor point of view there are huge differences uh, for example like you like like we all know uh, in india we have sebi and if you want to list on the markets you have to abide by all the regulations of the regulator you have to abide by all the guidelines and uh, you know requirements of the stock exchanges you have to for example share your quarterly results uh, you know within a certain time frame after the quarter gets over or when the year gets over etc i think on the unlisted side there are no such regulations you know the requirements are there and as investors we want all of that data uh, the requirement is there but the regulation is not there uh, so so i think that's one big difference the second difference which i think is a very important difference again is on the on the listed markets if you do not like something about the company because you know companies are growing organism things keep changing if you do not like what's happening what's going on or what's coming uh, you know in in the near future etc you can like they say vote with your feet you can sell the stock and get out in the unlisted markets you have no such luxury uh, because uh, there is no liquidity who do you sell to etc etc um and i think the third important thing uh, you know which kind of ties in with uh, with the first and the second in a way is governance i think when you look at listed markets there are certain set governance standards and companies have no choice but not only to adhere to those standards but also be transparent about it in the private markets uh, you know companies do not have to be transparent to the market because they are private uh, but they do have to be transparent to their investors Uh, so i think there are a lot of similarities between listed and unlisted at the same time like we just discussed there are enough and more differences uh, you know between the two asset classes right so then why would somebody participate in an unlisted space what is the dif- i mean what is the core benefit that an investor can see from moving or increasing or changing their portfolio to increase a little bit of an unlisted uh sliver yeah i think uh, you, let me expand that question a little bit more you know from uh, let's not be biased only from an investor standpoint uh, but also from a company standpoint why would a company want to be uh, unlisted you know or why would a company want to be listed for that matter i think we need to think of that as well uh, so i think there are two different ecosystems like we like we spoke a few minutes back uh, a company wants to be listed because it wants price discovery it wants access to public capital for all the projects and expansion that they have planned uh, a company wants to be listed so that they they have they are well known they are well researched and there's enough and more information that the company's suppliers vendors buyers you know all of all of them know the company uh, from an investor standpoint uh, we participate in listed markets because of the transparency governance standards regulations you know all of that now when you look at the private markets uh, a company first of all wants to remain private so that it doesn't have to deal with the headache of regulators exchanges 10000 investors asking 10000 and more questions all the time you know it's a choice from an investor standpoint you want to participate in unlisted companies because you so, so there's capital that that is seeking investment opportunities and that capital wants to invest in opportunities that are going to multiply and grow right it doesn't matter whether they are listed or unlisted so there are certain certain allocation that investors will have for listed markets and then certain allocations that every investor should have for unlisted markets because just because a company is listed therefore my portfolio allocation doesn't have to involve only those companies and those businesses why can't i access a whole lot of other businesses which are great companies great businesses but they are not listed right so i think that is the that is a nuance there and by its very nature and how the ecosystems have have grown over a period of decades is that private markets are not very accessible to individual investors but they are very accessible to pools of capital so you have a private equity firm you have a large family office i think they have good access to private uh, you know investment opportunities as well uh, so the only way for for individual investors to participate in private markets is through participation in funds that are investing in private opportunities whether that is private equity whether that is angel capital whether that is venture capital uh, i think you need to be part of or a part of your allocation has to go for such opportunities such funds to make sure that you're not missing out on on huge growth that is going on in the private side private market right so uh, you know continuing from there is now there's an entire plethora of different options from uh, in the unlisted space 
and uh, you started equanimity of course you've had private equity experience as well but you started equanimity in the early stage space so why why uh, early stage um uh, because we are greedy i think if you look at data it's very uh, it's very apparent and i think forget data i mean we all from our own personal experience can uh, can attest to what i'm saying is the the quantum of growth that a smaller entity whether it is a business or let's say uh, a human being a small baby right the amount of growth uh, you know noticeable growth that a business which is very young and fledgling sees or a young baby sees is far higher than the growth that you will see in mature companies or mature adults right you and i we can aspire to become better versions of ourselves but the change is going to be very very fleeting very slow gradual etc similarly when a larger company wants to you know grow at that scale that they already have their growth rates are going to be capped by the sheer size that they already have uh, procured for themselves but when you look at early stage companies you know even if the company goes from 1% market share to 3% market share right or from 0.25% market share to 1% market share the growth in the size of the company can be 10x 50x 100x hmm. now that's the kind of growth uh, which which we are chasing we are seeking and why we are wanting to do that or why we decided to go with the early stage and not with the late stage companies is because factors in india that that support growth in the early stage uh, of companies and businesses i think those factors are now in place uh, we are seeing that and over the last right. few years that we've been in business we've seen uh, companies uh, come to uh, you know uh, come to birth come to life and they're mushrooming they're growing some of them have actually gone and listed themselves already in the market so they are pretty large companies yeah. uh, i mean look at the examples of Yeah. some very known names that got listed you know whether that is let's say uh, a nike uh, zomato i mean all these companies right at some point in time these companies were startups early stage if an investor had exposure to these businesses at an early stage can you imagine the kind of returns they would have made uh, given where those companies today are right that's one side of the story so this is what we are aligned to on the other hand imagine investors who got involved with these both companies or any of these similar companies you know nike zomato etc after they got listed what kind of returns have you made i mean the luckiest investor in these companies listed markets has doubled his money right mm. but from the early stage your money is 500 times yeah. no comparison yeah. you know that may sound very nice and lucrative and you know why the hell do any does anybody go to listed market but the story is not that simple <laughs> i think the the probability of success in the early stage is lower so you have to be very choosy and very picky about companies and founders that you back unlike the listed markets where companies are mature so fatality rates are very very different mortality rates are very different uh, companies don't die overnight right so that yeah. risk is not there or not as much uh, as in the early stage so i think both the ecosystems have their pros and cons and that's why i always advocate uh, you know do invest in listed markets but also do invest in unlisted markets because uh, the risk return profile the dynamics the impact that these investments or these portfolios can have on your overall wealth over uh, 5 10 20 years is is very material is huge that's true okay so um the other question that i wanted to ask you is you know you you were an early angel investor and then you started this fund why did you feel the need to you know structure it into a fund rather than you know continuing that angel investment journey which was very fruitful for you yeah i think uh, it's a very valid question and it's a question actually that i keep asking myself why why <laughs> <laughs> but i think uh, it's it's been a it, it's a good decision i think i'm very happy that i decided to walk down this path for a few reasons i think one is uh, you know we are all humans and we find uh, safety in numbers so i think it's far better to uh, have 10 brains and 10 minds that are working on a on an idea than just one uh, so i think we have a team a fabulous team of uh, analysts and associates who uh, you really bring very different flavor to our understanding of businesses there are things that the partners may miss which the team sometimes brings out uh, you know and and i think that's that's a huge positive uh, also i think uh, from a, a portfolio point of view you know there is a certain amount of diversification that we seek 
at the same time so you don't want to have just four investments you want to have 20 at the same time you don't want to have just a few uh, you know 100000 per company you want to have a little sizable chunk in that company so that you can influence the company and its growth and its direction and i think all of these things are better done in a fund structure than with individual capital uh, also i think when you do a fund structure uh, you know cuck into my conversation about listed markets uh, you now are governed by sebi so there are certain standards that you have to meet uh, etc and which is i think uh, fabulous so you know it helps it's a, it's a win win for sure i have some questions coming in which out of which one i'm going to ask is are from aisha what role does market research play in development of a new asset class for startup investment so what is the influence of market research for us now i think any investor who is investing in listed market or unlisted market or you know wherever market research is extremely important uh, i think from our standpoint when we invest in companies most of these companies are targeting markets that really do not exist you know again you know just to bring out the differences mature companies that are typically listed are the the way they grow is uh, there are two factors one is growth in the industry itself and second is how much share you take from competitors so it's a very competitive uh, part of the of the life cycle of a company at the early stage i think the dynamics are very different sometimes as i said the markets are not defined it's a new market you're targeting you're trying to disrupt something you're trying to innovate and make something very very new uh, and therefore from an investor standpoint if you have done your market research and if you have built a thesis around which you want to invest saying okay you know what today this market is very nascent very small but over the next 3 5 years which is my investment horizon the market can grow to xyz uh, so i think for our stage of investing market research is extremely important uh, but the market research at an early stage comes with a twist as i said the it is not about researching an existing market sometimes you have your research has to be very very much like let's say crystal ball gazing you know you are trying to predict how the market is going to shape up what's going to happen what are the factors influencing it so i think to that extent as a venture capital investor your understanding of markets has to be far deeper than with a with a with the late stage mature companies true true um another question from chirag says he was looking forward to the session and so for those new to vc could you please provide an example that showcases the returns one can achieve in this asset class yeah i think let me give you a stellar example no uh, nika i just mentioned nika right i mean somehow Uh, all the data is public so you can just go to uh, now you don't even have to go to google just go to gpt and uh, you will get your answer uh, you know what is the return investors made uh, in the, the the first round of investment that nika raised right it's in the drsp just go to sebi website download the drsp you have all of it in there uh, what kind of returns did the first uh, early stage investors make from nika what is the kind of return second uh, series a series b c who, you know who made how much it's all there it's all there the numbers are fabulous the numbers are fantastic uh, but i think like i said the mortality rates are also uh, you know what they are so of every 10 companies that you invest in only one or two will give you these kind of returns you know you don't expect all 10 of them to deliver these kind of returns which means on an average in the early stage ecosystem if you are able to make let's say a 50% irr for yourself over a 10 year period I think that's fantastic, fabulous. You're like uh, you're already a millionaire. So okay, so this uh, interesting question from Samrid um, says that uh, you know the VC landscape. What do you think it would be like in the next five to ten years? Again, you know this is crystal ball gazing, uh, but let me let me indulge in this. Uh, I think in the next five to ten years, the ecosystem will be a little bit more mature than where it is today. Uh, i'll give you an example right after 2021 the the high that the market saw 22 and 23 have been very difficult years not only for funds and investors but also for companies and founders uh, i think one of the reason is that we were too reliant and we still are too reliant on uh, foreign capital uh, there are some numbers that i can point you to for example if you look at all the investments that have gone into uh, early stage or technology enabled companies you know uh, the tech ecosystem i think roughly 80 to 85% capital is foreign capital and uh, you know indians have not participated as much i think that will change over the next 5 to 10 years you will have like us you will have uh, far more many 
uh, we seek firms that have raised domestic capital uh, because the domestic investors are pretty savvy. They have uh, seen how wealth can be generated not only in listed market, but also they have some exposure to unlisted uh, markets as angel investors. Uh, so I think as this cycle turns and you see again an upswing in uh, capital flows, uh, you will see far more interest from domestic investors. Uh, I think VC ecosystem by itself, a VC investor as in itself, has to be longer term. Anyone who's working at a VC firm has to have a very long term view because every, every cycle you know, for the fund is about seven years. So you cannot bring your short term mind to a very long term game. You're in the wrong, you're in the wrong game, right? So, so employees, managers, investors, founders, you know, companies, I think we all have to make sure that we are not swayed too much by what happened last quarter, what happened last month or last year. These are, these are long term uh, asset classes. And I think if you stick with it, uh, you know, there's the the way will take you uh, where it has to. So just stick with it. So, so in in your opinion, how do you ride, how do you identify and capitalize on upcoming trends in the market? This is a question from Aman. I wish there was a simple formula to share of how do you identify new markets, trends, industries, areas you want to deploy capital in. Uh, unfortunately, Aman, there's no uh, no straightforward simple answer. Uh, I think it comes a lot uh, with experience. If you've seen a few cycles, if you've seen the the emergence and then the uh, you know uh, annihilation of sectors which we've seen over the years, you will realize that of every ten trends that you see, there will be one or two that stick. Right now, how do you decide which are those one or two trends that will stick? Right, I think that uh, that comes with only with experience or with luck. Uh, so, so I think it's a it's a very it's a it's a very good question you asked, uh, but I think there's no no straightforward answer to that. Sorry, uh, the only thing is you rely on experience and you figure out okay this is the construct of the world today. This is the construct of you know this industry today. Uh, if these changes come in, uh, for example, AI. Right? I mean, look at any industry. Look at healthcare, for example. You know, just any one sector. Look at healthcare, health tech. Uh, now, with AI coming in and AI becoming remaining relevant for the next five, 10 years, uh, which in our opinion it will, uh, right? If it does, how does it change that sector? And if it if those changes are to happen, who are going to be the beneficiaries? So you are deploying capital today to capitalize and to and to you know make money uh, and create wealth from things that are going to happen five years out. Uh, so you need to have that kind of, of foresight. Okay. So a uh, question from Kabir, he says, uh, what avenues exist for retail investors to participate in the unlisted market? Yeah, the first and foremost is you reach out to Monica and she will tell you how to participate in, <laughs> in the unlisted market. Uh, I think the safer bet uh, for individual investors to participate in unlisted markets is to go through funds. Uh, funds are organized. They are uh, governed by regulations and regulators. They are uh, managed by professionals. They are uh, manned by people who've seen cycles and understand uh, what can go wrong, right, etc. Doesn't mean that there's any guarantee that you will uh, generate fantastic returns out of it, but it does make sure that whatever you're doing, uh, you know, it's it's done with a lot of uh, insight. It's done with a lot of diligence and care. Uh, so my simple submission to this is, uh, please, uh, if you want to participate, uh, either you go support some friend of yours who's starting a new business, you know, that's a startup and you're participating with capital, or you come to funds like ours and participate in uh, in that growth. So um, now another question from Nisha that is rolling in. So she asked that BC funds sound cool, but honestly, I have no idea about this and I'm eager to explore more. Could you please suggest some resources, LinkedIn profiles of people in this niche to me? Thank you. Yeah, sure. I mean, if you can share your email ID, uh, we can send you some stuff uh, for your research later. But suffice to say, there's enough and more information out there. Go to the websites of a few venture capital firms like ours. Uh, ours is www.equanimity, name of the firm, uh, .vc, Venture Capital. Uh, and you will see lots and lots of resources. I think, uh, you know, the ecosystem where it was five, six years back when we started to where it is today, it's it's traveled a lot, uh, in a lot of distance. 
and i think there's far more information today than it ever used to be uh, and i think it's only getting better so uh, so i would encourage you to visit uh, not only linkedin profiles of venture capital investors in india but also their websites you know go to the websites of these funds you will learn learn much more or come spend a day with us in our offices you will learn much more yes absolutely i think message us on on uh, on thinkly and we'll get in touch with you for sure for that um vikram asks could you please talk about the historical returns in the vc space and compared to public markets and the risk associated with these sectors yeah sure i think if you want to quantify there's a framework i can share with you uh, honestly as i said the ecosystem is just still fledgling just it's grown it's come a long way over the last 5 years uh, but still not an organized market so i would take any published number out there uh, and there are a few estimates i would take each of them with a pinch of salt uh, but i think here's a framework that i can share with you of how to think about returns from uh, vc firms or early stage deals um uh, I mean, look at look at India, and if you want to make a very safe investment in in this country in in Indian rupees, you will go and you will buy government securities, or you will go and you will uh, open a fixed deposit uh, account with the bank, right? That's pretty safe. Uh, that gives you roughly about seven percent, let's say. Now, if you take a little more risk, right? And I think you have to judge returns based on uh, on risk. You know, risk and return are two sides of the same coin. so if you want to get some more returns you will have to assume a little more risk which essentially means let's say you go to uh, the bond market listed debentures etc your returns will be between 8 and 9% for that enhanced little amount of risk that you assumed from there you go to listed markets you know large cap stocks mid cap small caps you know doesn't matter which one uh, i think equity markets on an average will give you depending on large cap small cap mid cap where you are you will get between uh, i think 9% to uh, 12 13% per annum uh, compounded over over a 10 year period you know that's typically been what the markets have delivered in the past i think there was a time when 15% was the norm in my opinion that 15% has come off to 12 uh, because interest rates in the economy have come off you know the 15% thumb rule was in an india where 15 to 18% was coupon paid by uh, tata steel tata power all the you know reliance on the big companies now those companies raise money at half the cost right so interest rates have actually uh, actually come off which is which is good for indian business by the way uh, and i think when you when you go from these listed market uh, return risk return profiles to unlisted markets you know ecosystems like ours uh, i think your general expectation as an investor you should expect markets to give you about uh, 20 to 30% irrs or compounded returns over a 10 year period uh, and i think if you make anything more than that it's 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 uh, it's fabulous it's fantastic so that's what i would think about risk and return uh, from different assets so i think we're almost out of time so i'm just going to take one last question if that's okay um so rashi has an interesting question which is how can i entrepreneurs identify opportunities for innovating and establishing a new asset class sorry if i've understood this right you're saying how can entrepreneurs figure out opportunities in uh, newer areas right yeah, i don't understand the asset class reference there uh but i'm i'm imagining that if you're an entrepreneur you want to uh, open up a completely new space you know blue skies is not been done before uh, uh i think uh, the way i would approach the problem is a little different i would not say okay i, I want to be an entrepreneur i want to uh, have a startup of, of my own let me figure out which is the space that is the best right uh, i wouldn't get i wouldn't take that approach my recommendation will be the other way around you have to figure out yourself first you have to figure out what are your strengths you know what really interests you what are those problems in those areas where you are willing to stick through you know through uh, very very tough times uh, all right and then when you get the answer to that whichever area that is uh, i think that is the area where you should start looking for problems that you want to solve and i think when you figure out solutions to problems in a space that you understand and you're passionate about you will stick to the problem uh, much longer and you will uh, you will you will find success far more easier you know remember uh, you know our friend mr einstein was asked once 
you know how are you so smart and so intelligent and he says i'm not i just stick with problems longer so so i think as an entrepreneur you have to have the ability of sticking with problems longer and that will happen only when you when you like that area you love that area and you will you will tend to spend more time and solve it thank you rajesh i think this is an amazing space to to end the session um thank you for joining us thank you for your time and thank you everyone else for joining us please ask what questions you want on the app in thinkly and we will get back to you with the answers there thank you bye thanks monica thanks everybody bye bye